Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Introduction to Survival Analysis in R workshop. Uh, this workshop is brand new. Um, it was written very, very recently. So uh, we appreciate any feedback that you can give us at the end of the workshop today. There'll be a chance for you to fill out a really short feedback survey, and we would really appreciate it so we can make this better and better in the future. Um, we are the UCLA Statistical Consulting, I'm sorry, <laughs> we are the UCLA Office of Advanced Research Computing, and my group is called the Statistical Methods and Data Analytics Group. We're a group of statistical consultants, uh, and we basically help UCLA researchers with their statistical analysis. Today, I have with me one of uh, our consultants, Siavash Jalal. He'll be helping today with some of your questions in the chat. Um, on that, I'm gonna ask that you keep your microphones turned off uh, and that you ask questions in the chat whenever they come up. I may pause every so often and, and during those pauses, uh, you can unmute your mic and ask, but I ask that you keep them muted during the regular session so that the recording is easy to understand. Uh, similarly, I ask that you keep your cameras off um, and then maybe during those breaks, you can turn them on. But again, having the camera on may be disruptive for other people. Um, finally, I'm going to just remind you again that we do have a survey at the end, so we would appreciate it if you would fill that out at the end. Um, for those of you that came a little late, let me go ahead and link the workshop web page into the chat. Um, if you go to that page, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing screens. If you go to that page, it should look like this. These are the three packages you'll need to install. GGplot is also um, a package we're using here, but it's one of the dependencies of ServeMiner, so it should be installed with ServeMiner. Um, then this right here is the link to the slides. If you click on it, it should open a new tab for you. And this tab is the slideshow itself. So you can use, for instance, your arrow keys to go left and right or advance the slides. Um, one thing I'm going to recommend you do, especially if you're following along, is that you hit the K key. The K key disables mouse click advance of the slide. So before you hit the K key, if you hit the mouse click, it will actually advance the slides. And you may find that that is, uh, it makes it hard for you to copy and paste code into your R studio. So if you want to copy, copy the code directly from the slide, into our studio, uh, hit the K key and it should say disable mouse advance and then hit okay. Okay, so we're gonna be teaching from this slideshow. Um, it's up to you whether you wanna follow yourself or you can just watch the screen. I'll have it up the whole time also mostly. Um, I'm occasionally gonna be going to R once in a while here. Um, so keep that in mind. Finally, at the bottom, there is the code file. And this file contains all the R code that we're gonna be using in the workshop, including all the code on the slides. We have a couple exercises that are interactive that you, know, you can do during this workshop to practice some of the coding that you're gonna learn. So you can either uh, download this code file by right-clicking it, or you can left-click it and then just select the whole thing and copy and paste the whole thing into um, your R editor. Um, the solutions to the exercises are at the very bottom. So if you want to participate, um, I'm going to ask you to not look at the oops, not look at the solutions until we actually do the exercises. So here I just copy and pasted it into my R editor right here, our R Studio editor. Uh, you can do that, or you can download it. Either way, it's only though, of course, if you want to follow along. You don't actually have to have this code file. All the code and output is in the presentation. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the purpose of this workshop is to provide just enough background in survival analysis so that you can use the survival package in R to estimate survival functions, test whether these survival functions are different between groups, and then fit a Cox proportional hazard model and test its assumptions. Uh, we're going to be concentrating uh, on the survival package today and the tools in it. All of the tools that we're using today to estimate survival analysis models and texts are from the survival package. Uh, the survival package was created by Terry Turnell, 
uh, who was a researcher and expert in survival analysis, so the package is very trustworthy. Uh, Ternot co-authored a book called Modeling Survival Data, Extending the Cox Model with Patricia Gramsh. And this is a great book for those of you that are learning survival analysis um, because it talks about both survival analysis and the survival package in R. Uh, these two also developed some of the methods that are used to assess the proportional hazards assumption of the Cox model. So as I said, they are true uh, experts in the field. The survival package is widely used, it's very popular. And so it's inspired other packages in R to be created so that we can extend the functionality. One of those packages we're gonna to use today, which is called ServeMiner. And in ServeMiner, we're really using it for its uh, function ggServePlot. And we're gonna use this function to create really nice looking, really customizable plots of survival functions. We're also gonna use the broom package for a its tidy function. And the tidy function takes some of the objects created by the survival package and it cleans up the output and makes it a nice table and saves it at a data frame, okay? Um, if you are following in RStudio, go ahead and load the workshop now with library, okay? Sorry. So as an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, first, we're gonna do a quick review of survival analysis, hopefully pretty quick. Uh, then we're gonna talk about setting up your data, uh, then estimating the survival function, for instance, with the Kaplan-Meier estimator, comparing survival curves between groups. Then we're gonna have a short introduction to the Cox proportional hazard model. Then we'll discuss how to fit the Cox model with Cox BH, how to produce predictions, from the Cox model, how to assess the proportional hazards assumption, and then uh, how to model time variant covariates. All of this is if time permits. Um, so hopefully we can get through everything today. Okay, so I wanna start, first start with a quick review of survival analysis, but before that, I wanna see how much you know already. So I'm gonna launch a poll, it's all anonymous. So just answer these two questions to the best of your ability and We'll see how much you know about R and about survival analysis. All right, I'll give you like 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Most of you have answered, thank you for that. Let's look. So uh, most of you have used R somewhat or a lot in the past, that's good. Um, I don't have a lot of opportunity to explain some of the more basic R coding, so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to uh, ask in the chat. But for instance, I'm not going to explain what a data frame is. Um, hopefully, most of you know what a data frame is. Um, how much do you know about survival analysis? It looks like the majority of you know very little. Um, some of you do have a little bit of familiarity, and some of you have some expertise, it looks like, in survival analysis. So um, because the most of you have not had exposure or much exposure, I'm going to take it slow. All right. Thanks for answering that. Okay. So, what is survival analysis? Well, survival analysis models how much time elapses before an event occurs. So we wanna look at how long does it take for events occurred for various subjects. The outcome variable is the length of time to an event. And this variable can be referred to as survival time, it's sometimes referred to as failure time or time to event. Some examples of events include death upon contracting a disease. And so because of the word death, uh, because survival analysis was used to model things like death, it gained the name survival analysis. Uh, but it doesn't have to be death. It can be other events like divorce, or the manufacturing, sorry, the malfunctioning of a machine, 
uh, or it could be the time to the first job. So we wanna look at how long it takes for somebody to get divorced, how long it takes for a machine to malfunction, how long it takes somebody to get their first job. Um, because of its long history in the reliability literature, um, it's sometimes events are known as failures. Okay, so when we look at the reliability of machines, when they fail, they're called failures. So a lot of times, even though the event may be positive, we still refer to the event as failures. Almost anything can be framed as the event of interest. So survival analysis has broad applications across many fields. You know, you, like these are very diverse events and basically anything can be an event. So anytime you wanna look at the time to an event, survival analysis is a good option. We often say that a subject is at risk and that, that they're a member of the risk set before the event occurs or before the subject's time is censored. I'm gonna explain what censoring is later, but what I wanna say is that while the subject still has not experienced the event, we say that they're at risk, okay? And that they're a member of the risk set. Okay. So one of the goals of survival analysis is to estimate the probability that a subject survives without experiencing the event past some particular time t. We can infer these probabilities by observing how long different subjects remain at risk before they fail, before they experience the event. In other words, we can infer these probabilities by observing subjects' actual survival times. So to uh, introduce some of the concepts in survival, first, let T, big T, be a random variable representing a subject's true survival time. So some subjects may have T at 100 days, some of them may be two days, some of them may be 1,000 days. Sometimes we cannot observe a subject's true survival time during the course of a study, and this is known as censoring. And I'll go much more to detail about censoring in a little bit. In general, we say that we observe subjects follow-up time. And for some subjects, this is gonna be the true survival time T, we're actually gonna observe the subject fail during a study. But for other subjects, it's gonna be the censoring time. We're not gonna be able to observe them actually fail. So in general, we're gonna call this follow-up time, which is gonna include both survival times and censoring times. Okay, so one of the main things we wanna estimate in survival analysis is the survival function S of T. And this function expresses the probability that a subject's true survival time, big T, will exceed some particular time, little t. In other, word, it, in other words, it expresses the probability that the subject survives beyond time t. Um, so here we have S of t is equal to the probability that big T is greater than little t. So big T is the actual survival times and little t is some particular time point, okay? So here we have an example of a survival function. On the y-axis, we have the probability of survival and on the x-axis, we have days or time. And so the survival function gives us the probability that a subject survives beyond a particular time. So here at day 100, we see that the survival function estimate is 0.577. So we interpret this to mean that subjects are, I'm sorry, subjects are expected to have a 0.57 probability of surviving beyond day 100. And then they also have a 0.122 probability of surviving beyond day 200, all right? So we can get the probability of surviving any, beyond any time point using the survival function. So this is one of the primary things we're interested in in survival analysis. Um, typically we assume that uh, the survival at time zero is one, which means that all subjects survive the very, very first moment where we start observing them. So time zero represents the first moment that a subject becomes at risk for the event, right? So, you know, you may not become at risk for an event until something happens. So for instance, if we're looking at death after contracting COVID, you become at risk as soon as you contract COVID, not, you know, since you were born. Some, there may be some event that puts you at risk and then we're looking at the time it takes for some other event to occur, okay? 
But the assumption is that everybody survives the very, very first moment, S of zero is equal to one. The other assumption we make is that S of infinity is equal to zero. And what we say there is that after an infinite amount of time, everybody should have failed by then. All right, so the survival probability at infinite time is zero. One concept or one uh, quantity that people are often interested in is median survival time. And median survival time has, uh, is interpreted, I'm sorry, me the median survival time is defined as the time at which 50% of the population is expected to still, still be surviving. So uh, the y-axis is the probability. So we wanna find 0.5 on the y-axis and then we just find the time point that corresponds to 0.5 on the survival function. And here it happens to be uh, 114.2 days. So 50% of the population is expected to be still surviving after 114.2 days, and that's median survival. So median survival is actually a time, not a probability. Okay, so survival is, you know, this, this survival function is something that we're usually very interested in estimating. And some, some methods like Kaplan-Meier, uh, the Kaplan-Meier estimator focus on estimating this survival function. But there are other methods like the Cox model that focus on the hazard function. And sometimes the hazard function is also known as the hazard rate. I'm going to label it H of T here. The hazard function is inversely related to survival. In other words, the higher the hazard, the lower the survival. We'll make all this clearer as we go along. So the hazard function at time t, or h of t, is defined as the instantaneous rate of events at time t, given that the subject has survived until time t. I know that sounds like a, like a mouthful, but basically the hazard rate is how many events we expect over a period of time given that a subject has survived up to this particular time point. We say the word instantaneous because the hazard could be changing continuously in time, moment to moment. So it may be a different hazard rate from a microsecond before if it's changing continuously in time. So that's why we use the word instantaneous because it may be different a moment later. So for instance, in this green curve, I have three hazard functions graphed here. In the green curve, the hazard at 200 days is 0.0204 events per day. So at day 200, basically over the course of that day, the subject has a probability of 0.0204 of failing. All right, so we expect this many events, this many failures per day at this day. At day 200.1, just a little bit later, the hazard rate has increased to 0.0241. So this is what we mean that it's an instantaneous rate because it can be changing over time. And you can see here, like on the green curve or on the blue curve, that the hazard is changing continuously with time. So it's never the same at any two points on the green curve or the blue curve. The red curve, it actually has a constant hazard, which means that the hazard is not changing. Okay, so the hazard can go up in time, it can go down over time, or it can stay constant. So, you know, something like a hazard that increases over time is generally, for instance, the hazard of death increases with time after a certain age, right? So after, you know, you become an adult, as you get older and older, the hazard for death increases with time. Uh, but maybe the hazard for an earthquake is constant. It doesn't really change over time, right? We're always at the same hazard in California, more or less, for an earthquake. At least in a simplistic model, we might think like that. In other cases, the hazard might be decreasing. Maybe you get a surgery to correct some major illness, and then after the surgery, the hazard for death decreases because you've corrected or you've kind of um, tried to provide treatment for that illness, okay? One thing that is important to realize is that the hazard is never negative. It can be zero, meaning that there's no events expected, but you can have negative events expected per unit time. Okay. okay. So that is the hazard function. And of course, we can never observe the hazard function, but we are often interested in it because it is directly related to 
survival. And I'll get to how it's related to survival in just a moment. We talked about the hazard function. And again, that expresses the event rate or how many events per unit time we expect at a particular unit in time. That's the hazard. The cumulative hazard function expresses how much hazard a subject has accumulated over time up to time point T. So just like the name suggests, the idea here is that as a subject survives or remains without failing, they accumulate hazard, they accumulate risk for failing. So as you get older and older, you're accumulating more and more risk for death. Or as you know, your machine stays on, it accumulates more and more risk for failing. Um, so the relationship is that the cumulative hazard is the integral of the hazard function from zero to T. If you're not comfortable with integrals, don't worry about it too much. You can just think of this as summing the hazard from zero all the way to T. That's a good enough uh, understanding for this uh, workshop. Um, because the hazard function is never negative, the cumulative hazard can never decrease with time. So we're just summing the hazard over time to, uh, to get the cumulative hazard. And since the hazard is never negative, the cumulative hazard will never go down. It'll always either go up or stay flat, okay? So here I have three different hazard functions, the same three we saw on the previous slide, and then the three corresponding cumulative hazards. You can see, for example, that the green curve people they start out with the lowest hazard. And so actually at the beginning of time, the green curve actually has the lowest cumulative hazard, but their hazard grows pretty quickly. And eventually the hazard rate for the green people is higher than for the red and the blue people. And so eventually the cumulative hazard for the green people becomes larger than the cumulative hazard for the red and blue people. And so at some point, the green people past day 100 will we'll, we'll have accumulated more risk of failure than the people in the red and blue curves. So we would expect survival overall to be worse for people in the green curve, and that's exactly true. The survival function is inversely related to the cumulative hazard function, okay? So we've just discussed the hazard, which accumulates over time to become the cumulative hazard, and now we can, see the direct relationship between the cumulative hazard function and the survival function. Um, the survival function is the cumulative, the, sorry, the, so, let me say that again. The survival function is the exponentiation of the negative of the cumulative hazard function. For those of you that are uncomfortable with exponentiation, it's basically the, the E, Euler's number E, which is basically around 2.71 taken to the power negative HT. So you take it to, uh, you find the cumulative hazard estimate, let's say at 300 here, it's, it's around five. You put negative five here, exponentiate it. And then if you exponentiate ne uh, negative five, it's somewhere down here, okay? What it means though, is that survival and the cumulative hazard are inversely related such that the higher the cumulative hazard, the lower the survival. So again, the green, the people who have a green hazard function actually have a lower cumulative hazard before day 100, therefore they have better survival. Then after day 100, their cumulative hazard is higher than the other two curves. And therefore after day 100, their survival is also lower, okay? So the idea is, again, that you're accumulating risk, and that accumulated risk is what's directly related to survival in an inverse way. Okay, let me go ahead and stop and pause there. Are there you can, if you want to, you can unmic yourself now, or you can put your questions in the chat. Are there any questions about survival or the hazard or the cumulative hazard function or their relationships with each other? Kansina Bosch, if there were any questions that were asked in the chat um, that I didn't answer, go ahead and let me know. Not really, just one question was that, how do we know median survival time if 
for people who are censored this time is not available. And that's we that's the idea. We will see how we will see how censoring affects our survival in a second. Um, hopefully that'll become clear later. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to address that. So for survival analysis, should subjects who never fail to be excluded from the sample? And the answer is absolutely not. They should be included. You should put them in the data set, record when you last saw them, and then record them as censored, all right? I, I'll go over that in a minute, but that would definitely not, you want to include them. You, you get, you learn something from censored observation. You, you know that they survived at least this long. So that tells you something and it's better to have that data than not, okay? Very good question. Okay, so let's talk about sense. Many times the exact time when the event occurs is gonna be unknown or what we call sensor. I'm sorry, there is one more function. There's one more question. The hazard function is inverse function of survival function, but it's not exactly the inverse, they're inversely related. Meaning that as the cumulative hazard goes up, survival goes down, but it's not the actual inverse function. No. But they're inversely related, yeah. Okay, sorry, back to censoring. So censoring means basically that we don't know the exact time when the event occurred for a subject. And there are different kinds of censoring. First, right censoring means that a subject's actual survival time is greater than their observed time. So here, I have a depiction of censoring. The red squares represent observed events. In this case, the event is death. So these subject four and subject one um, both experience the event, okay? But subjects two and subject three are censored because we lost contact with them before we were able to observe their event. In the case of subject two, it's because they dropped out of the study. In the case of subject three, it's because the study ended. So let's say we observe these subjects for up to two years and then we run out of funding after two years. Uh, then we have to stop. So not everybody, not every subject may have experienced uh, death by the end of two years. All those subjects will be censored then. But some subjects may just simply drop out or they may experience something else that uh, prevents, in this case, it's not a good example, but for instance, if you're looking at time to something else and the subject dies, like time to, um, I don't know, remission from disease, but the subject dies, that might remove them from being at risk for being uh, in remission, okay? So right censoring occurs usually from one of these reasons, the study ends before the event occurs, or the subject is lost of follow-up, or the subject is no longer at risk for the event after the study begins. To go back to the question that was asked, you absolutely want to include subjects two and three in this data set. You know subject three, you have some information. You know they survived at least 730 days. And you know that subject two survived at least 300 and something days here. So that's some information and you should use that information. This is right censoring. Um, most of the data, well, all the data we're dealing with today has right censoring, but there are other kinds of censoring. There's also left censoring. Less censoring means that the subject's actual survival time is less than their observed time. So remember, right censoring means that the true survival time is greater than their observed time. Left censoring means that the true survival time is less than the observed time. One common example is when the event is defined as disease infection. A lot of our tests for disease infection have delays, or the subject may not know that they're infected and may do this test years later. So for instance, if you're inter interested in COVID infection, you may use something like a COVID test, right? To determine when somebody experienced, when somebody actually got infected with COVID. However, we know that those tests are delayed and we don't know the, we won't know the actual day that that person got infected in general. Uh, another example is an HIV test. Um, subjects with HIV may have no idea that they've been infected with HIV for years. And so the positive test 
for HIV may come way later than the infection, all right? So this is this subject five is an example of left censoring. We know that at the maximum time point that they got infected is 90, but we think it's somewhere before 90 when they actually got infected, okay? And then there's interval censoring. And interval censoring means that we know, we don't know the exact time when the subject had the event, but we know that it lies between two points. And so an example of interval censoring is that there's a negative test and then there's a positive test, but the positive test is delayed with respect to the event. So here we might have a negative COVID test and then a positive COVID test several days later, but we don't know the exact day when the infection actually occurred, all right? So this is an example of interval censoring. Um, we're only gonna be discussing right censoring in this workshop, okay? So only this type of censoring. And fortunately, it is by far the most common sort of, sort of censoring. All of the methods that we discussed today have no problem dealing with right censoring. If though you want, if you want to do, um, if you want to model and some of your data are actually left or interval censored, you need special methods to do that that we're not talking about today. One reason that we can't use standard methods like linear regression to do survival analysis is because of censoring. Um, these methods are not equipped to deal with censored outcomes. Okay, so that is censoring. Now, all the analyses that we're doing today also assume something called non-informative censoring. And for those of you that have some training in missing values, this is very similar to missing completely at random. Okay. Basically, the idea here is that we don't want a subject censoring time to give us any information about what their actual unobserved survival time would be had we been able to observe it. Another way of saying it, this is that the distribution of censoring time should be unrelated to the distribution of survival times. I have a picture of informative censoring here versus non-informative censoring on the right. So on the left, all the people that are censored are the ones that have the shortest survival times. So this is informative because we know that if somebody is censored, they're likely to have a short survival time. And this, that means that it's informative because it tells us something about their survival time. On the right though, you can see that subjects are censored in a non-informative way. Some of the subjects with the longest survival times are also censored. So we really can't tell what their survival time would be just by knowing when they are censored in this case, okay? So this is informative on the left, this is non-informative on the right. All of the methods we use today assume that censoring is like it is on the right, okay? So failing to account for informative sensing may result in biased estimates of survival. So I plotted three different things here, but two of them are, are, are perfectly on top of each other. So I, create, I did a survival estimate using three data sets. One data set is the actual fully observed true survival time. So as if I had all eight of these red dots, okay? That's the true survival time. That is the ideal. You wanna be able to observe everybody's survival time, but reality prevents that. So that is the ideal. Then another one is I use the data with informative censoring. And then the third data set is the data set with non-informative censoring. And what happens is the survival function for the true data with all the red dots or the non-informative censoring, they actually turn out to have exactly the same survival function estimate. However, if you try to estimate survival with informative censoring, you'll see that the survival function is quite different, right? It doesn't seem like anybody is failing up until day 600 in the informative censoring uh, data set. 
but in the non-informative censoring and the true data, people are failing much earlier, okay? So non-informative censoring, if it's truly non-informative, will not affect the survival estimate at all. Uh, what I don't have depicted here is the confidence interval. The confidence interval is tighter when you have all of the observed data than when you have some censoring. So that's the difference, is that your standard errors will be smaller with full data and you'll have tighter confidence intervals. So the variance will be lower, but the actual survival estimates are the same, okay? So what this means is think about your censoring. Think about what is causing the censoring. Is it just random dropout? Random dropout is good, but is it dropout because the subjects are higher or lower at risk? That's bad. So some examples of possible informative censoring and resulting bias are, for instance, the oldest subjects drop out of a study of time to death after surgery. Um, for instance, the oldest subjects might have the shortest survival times. So the survival estimates therefore might be biased upwards, right? The oldest people might be the ones that are highest at risk. So they would have the shortest survival times. If they drop out of the study, who the people that are left have longer survival times, so you're gonna have an overly optimistic look at survival. Here's another example. Let's say you're looking at time to first marriage and there are people in your study who just love to travel. Well, these travel loving subjects may drop out of the study because they wanna go off and travel somewhere and they don't wanna be part of your study anymore. Well, it turns out maybe those travel loving subjects are those subjects that would delay marriage because they wanna travel the world. And thus they would have the longest survival times. And so if they drop out of the study, you're gonna have people with in general shorter survival times. So your survival estimates may be biased downward in this case. I see uh, a question about imputing. Yes, so this is an option if you have variables in your data set that can predict the censoring, then an imputation might help you. And that is basically missing at random. Yeah, so missing data might help you in these cases, but what's nice is that you can still use the censor data as long as it's non-informative. If it's informative, then you have to think of other modeling strategies, okay? Are there any questions about right censoring in particular and or informative censoring and how it affects our analyses. Okay, if there's no questions, you know, you, you're always free to keep asking in the chat. Um, I'm gonna keep going. All right, so that is the brief review of survival analysis. All right, so we are interested in estimating the survival function or the hazard function. And we're gonna have probably some sensor data. That's fine as long as it's not informative. Okay, so we can talk about the actual data set. So the simplest data structure for a typical survival analysis involves, there's gonna be just one row per subject. There is gonna be a status variable that codes whether the subject experienced the event or is censored. There's gonna be a time variable which measures follow-up time. And that's gonna be either the time to event or it's gonna be the censoring time. So for those subjects that did not experience the event, you wanna record the time at which you last observed them. Okay, so whatever the time of last observation is, put that in for those subjects who are right censored, okay? Then you may also have covariates in the data set. And in this structure, these covariates are assumed to be time constant or not time varying, in other words, okay? Okay, so we're gonna start by looking at the AML data set and the survival packet. These data, they come from a study looking at time to death for patients with acute myelogenous leukemia. And it compares uh, maintained chemotherapy treatment or extended chemotherapy treatment to non-maintained or non-extended. Whether or not extending chemotherapy was helping these patients with acute myelogenous leukemia. It is a small data set. I mean, this is the entirety of the data set right here. 
So this variable right here is the survival time. So for instance, this first subject right here, um, we know that they survived up until day nine, and then they experienced the event on day nine. And this person was in the maintained group. This person, the next person also failed at day 13. However, there was somebody who centered at day 13. So this person did not experience the event, but the last time we saw this person was on day 13. Okay. All right. So the first thing you need to learn is the serve function, uh, capital S. Uh, remember that R is case sensitive. So you have to use capital S here. And you're gonna use the serve function to specify the outcome in your survival analyses. Now, there are a lot of different ways that survival data can be structured. So the serve function is a lot more flexible than I'm gonna make it look. But we wanna keep things simple today. So we're gonna use very simple serve specifications today. So for data with a single time variable indicating time to event or censoring, your serve specification is gonna look like this. You, you have the serve keyword or the function name, and then inside parentheses, you're gonna put the time variable, comma, the event variable. Okay, so time should be uh, a survival or censoring time variable. And then the event variable should be a status variable. And the acceptable codes to use for censored or event are zero for censored, one for event, or one for censored and two for event, or false and true. Okay, false for censored and true for event. So zero, zero and one, one and two, false and true are all acceptable codes for the event variable. Serve assumes that censoring is right censored unless you use a type argument. We're not using the type argument today at all because we're not dealing with anything but right censoring today. Um, as a preview to something we're gonna be doing later, and for those of you that want more information, sometimes survival data are recorded with two time variables. One time variable marks the beginning of, an, of a time interval, and the other time variable marks the end of a time interval. Um, we need this format in order to model time variant covariates, model interval censoring, or to model recurrent events data. If you don't know what those things are, don't worry about it too much. Recurrent events, for instance, means that the same event can happen over and over, for instance, marriage. In this format, some or all the subjects can have multiple rows of data, all right? So the data we're talking about right now, every subject just has one row, but in this format, subjects can have multiple rows. This format is sometimes called start stop, start stop format, where start is the beginning of the interval, stop is the end of an, end of an interval. There's a data set we're gonna be looking at later on called JASA1 in the survival uh, package that has this format. It has a variable actually called start and a variable called stop. And here you can see um, this coincides with ID1 and they experience the event. Look at ID four, there are two rows for ID four. So the first row is for months zero to 35. The second row is for months 35 to 38. And you can see that the transplant variable changes. This is used to model time very covariates, okay? I'll talk about this more later. Hopefully if we have time to talk about time very covariates, I'll go into more detail. But for now, if you have data like this, you just, put both time variables in. So the, the beginning time variable, the ending time variable, and then the event. Okay. okay, any questions about survival data? Henry, we had uh, one last question was good. When event is not observed at the end of the study, we categorize this in sensor. Correct. So if the study ends before you observe an event, as long as you know that subject is still at risk, you would call that right sensor. Another question was about gap. And I think when you talk about, um, if you have only one uh, survival event, there is, uh, I don't think there is a gap because if the object come back to the study that and you lost the track, 
that means they are already survived. All you need is when yeah. the event happened. Yes. As long as you can be sure that the event did not occur during the gap, it's probably safe to just ignore that gap. But if it's a recurrent events like marriage, you absolutely cannot ignore that gap. You should use this stop start format. Uh, and then it's okay to have gaps in um, a subject's you know, records as long as you use start stop format. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Um, mixed treatments, again, is a time variant covariate. All right. So you need to code that using this kind of structure and you would code new intervals every time they treat, they change treatment status. Okay, um, so we wanna to try to estimate the survival function uh, finally. And Kaplan Meier estimator is one of the most popular methods to do this. It is a non-parametric method to estimate the survival function. And non-parametric here means that we're not assuming that there is any particular distribution of survival times. So we're just gonna use the data to guide us as to what the curve is supposed to look like. We're not making any assumptions about its shape. One of the reasons why Kaplan-Meier is so popular is it has this really nice, easy to understand intuitive formula. And so this is the estimator. This just means a product. Um, it's similar to the big sigma symbol used for sums, but this just means uh, take a product of all, all time points from the beginning of time up until the current time point. So this is estimating the survival at time t is the product of a bunch of, of these quantities up until time t. And what are these quantities? Well, look at the expression. It's one minus the number of events at a particular time point divided by the number of people at risk at a particular time point. So the number of events over the number of at risk is basically the proportion that failed, right? So this is the number of people that failed. And this is the number of people who are, were at risk of failing. So this right-hand fraction is the proportion that failed. One minus that is the proportion that didn't fail. Right, so the other people are the ones that didn't fail. So one minus this, this whole thing in the parentheses is the proportion that failed. And what you do for the Kaplan-Meier estimator is you calculate the proportion that didn't fail or the proportion that survived at each time point and you just multiply those proportions together through the current time point. I'll go over that calculation again just in a minute, but it's pretty simple. Okay, one thing you'll notice is that it only changes, this will only change if somebody actually experiences the event. When somebody is censored, S of T won't change. However, this number will get smaller. So once somebody is censored, they are not considered an event, but they will leave the risk set. Okay, I'll try to reinforce that point um, on the next slide. So we're gonna use the serve fit function in the survival package to get a Kaplan-Meier estimate of the survival function, okay? The first argument of serve fit is uh, a model formula where serve is gonna be used to specify the outcome on the left side of the tilde. And then on the right side of the tilde, you're gonna specify either a grouping variable or in this case, a one. A one means I want a survival function estimate for the whole data set, okay? So the function we're gonna use to get the Kaplan-Meier estimate is the uh, serve fit. Then the left side of the tilde is the outcome specification. Again, in um, AML, the time variable is called time and the status variable is called status. So. On the left side, we have serve, the time variable called time, status variable called status, tilde one. This says, give me the Kaplan-Meier estimate for the whole data set. I'm gonna save that in an object called KM. Okay? If I just print this object KM, it gives me a really, really short summary. 
And one of the things you can get out of that is median survival. But let me show you the other things. So if I just print it, like print here, print KM, it prints this little summary. N is the total number of subjects. Then it tells you how many events there were. Then it tells you median survival time and then a 95 confidence interval around um, the median survival time. So at day 27, and actually I think this is month 27, excuse me, at month 27, half of the subjects are expected to still be alive, okay? But we have a pretty wide confidence interval around that because the data are pretty sparse. It's only 20, 20, 20 something subjects, 21 or something like that, okay? Um, printing KM, you can also get just by issuing the name of the object, right? So I saved it as KM. If you just type KM, it'll do the same thing as print KM, okay? And so that is used to get the median. If you wanna get an actual table of the survival function, we're gonna use tidy on that KM object that we created, okay? So the tidy function from the broom package works on many of the objects created by the survival package. And then it'll create a table of output and then store it as a tibble. And a tibble is just a data frame. If you don't know what a data frame is, a data frame is a way to store data as kind of a, a matrix. Um, okay, so if we use tidy on the surfit object, it's gonna produce a table of the Kaplan-Meier estimate of the survival function, okay? So remember KM, is the object created by SurfFit right here. I'm gonna put that KM object inside of tidy. And I remember tidy comes from broom, not from survival. Okay. And then I'm gonna save the resulting object as KM.tab. And KM.tab is the table of the survival estimate, uh, Kaplan Meyer survival estimate. And it has the following columns. T is the time point. And since this is non-parametric, the survival estimate only changes when an event is observed. So these are the actual survival times that are observed in the data, right? Remember the AML data set is right here. And we have, for instance, an event at day five, an event at day eight, an event at day nine, right? And so in the Captain Meyer estimates, we have a survival estimate at day five, day eight, day nine. We don't have any estimates at one, two, three, four because nobody actually failed at those time points. So a key feature of the Kaplan Meyer estimate is that it only estimates survival when somebody actually fails. Okay, so time is the time point. N risk is the number of people at risk for the event. So they're still in the data set we're still observing them and they still could possibly fail. But at day, at day five, I'm sorry, month five, at month five, two of those 23 people fail. You remember the Kaplan-Meier formula? It's one minus the number of events divided by the number at risk. So one minus two over two, 23 is 0.913. And that is this number right here. So the estimate column is the Kaplan-Meier estimated survival at time five. So the way we interpret this is that taking the data set as a whole or at the population level, our estimate is that after five days, there's a 0.913 that a subject, uh, there's a 0.913 probability that the subject will still be alive, okay? Then we can uh, have the standard error of this Kaplan-Meier estimated survival and the confidence interval for it, okay? So you can track what's happening with this table, right? At first we have 23 people, two of them fail. Therefore, two people are out of the risk set now. So at the next time point, there are 21 people, right? Because two of them failed already. And then another two of them failed, okay? So where did this number 0.826 come from? Remember, the Kaplan-Meier estimator is just the product of the proportion that survive every time point up to the current time point. So we take that 0.913, that's the proportion that survived the first time point, time five, and we multiply that, this is 0.913 right here, we multiply that times the proportion that survived time point eight. 
And that proportion is one minus the two that fail over the 21 that are at risk. Please try not to annotate the screen if you can. Uh, we appreciate you not annotating. Um, okay, so the survival estimate at day eight is uh, the product of those two proportions, okay? And that's where this number 0.826 goes. So that's why it's such an, uh, an one reason why it's such a popular estimator is that it makes sense. This is the proportion that survived time point five. This is the proportion that survived time point eight. In order to make it past time point eight, you have to survive both time points, right? So the probability to survive both time points is the product of those two numbers. Okay. Uh, all right. So that is a table of the Kaplan Meier estimates. One thing you'll notice is it doesn't actually go down to zero. This will happen if the last person is censored. So if the last person is censored in your data set, the survival estimate may not go all the way down to zero. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention though, is that if there is no event, but there is a censoring event, but somebody is censored, the survival estimate doesn't change. So here at time point 13, there are 17 people at risk, one person failed and one person was censored. They were lost to follow up. Therefore, two people left the risk set. So then at the next time point, there are 15 people and there's one person who leaves because of censoring. You see though that the survival estimate does not change. That is key, okay? So when people leave due to censoring, they don't change the survival estimate, but they do change the number at risk. So they left. So now on the next time point, there's only 14 people at risk, okay? So once again, survival changes when somebody actually experiences the event. It does not change if somebody is just censored. Okay, a lot of times we wanna graph the survival function um, and it's very easy to do. We're just gonna take the object from serve fit, not the tidy object, but the original KM object from serve fit and you're just gonna stick it inside plot. Um, it's pretty bare bones. So you have to add, for instance, labels. So I added a label for the Y and the X axis here, but this is the plot of the survival function that corresponds to this table. And it has that step function look, which again means that whenever it goes down, you know that there was an event. When there, whenever it's flat, you know that there are no events in that period. Okay. So this is what non-parametric estimation looks like. It's not gonna be a nice smooth curve because we don't know what its shape should be. We're just letting the data dictate the shape, okay? If we had a lot more time points and a lot more data, this might look a lot smoother, but with less data, it's gonna look more and more jagged and kind of step-like here, okay? Okay. So this is the Kaplan-Meier survival function estimated for the entire data set. Usually that's not what you just wanna do. <laughs> Usually you wanna compare survival between groups or between people or something. So there's usually more to that. So now we wanna start creating, uh, uh, estimating survival for groups separately. Very simple to get separate Kaplan-Meier estimates. Um, after the tilde in serve fit, instead of putting a one, we're gonna put some grouping variable. Now remember in the AML data set, there is this X variable that stands for whether chemotherapy was maintained or not maintained, okay? So what serve fit is gonna do is it's literally gonna separate the data into two groups and then separately estimate survival using Kaplan-Meier estimator in each of those two groups, okay? So I save the object as km.x. And then just by printing the object, remember by specifying the name alone or putting it inside a print, I get the number of events now separately by straight up, right? So there were 11 subjects in the maintained group, 12 subjects in the non-maintained group, seven events in maintained, 11 in non-maintained, and then 31 is the median survival time for maintained and 23 is the median survival time for non-maintained. Just by looking at this, who do you think has a better survival time? Try to think about that to yourself. 
who, based on this median survival, who in general survives longer? Well, let's think. Median survival time is the survival time at which we expect 50% of people to still be alive. So 50% of the people in the maintain group are alive at day 31, well, whereas 50% of the non-maintained group are alive at 23. So in general, the people in the maintained group survive longer, okay? Now, we can also get a table of the two survival functions by strata by putting the object returned by surfit, pan.x, inside of tidy. And now tidy returns an extra column called strata. And so this first set of estimates here, this is the, sorry, this here is the survival function from the maintained group. And then the latter half is the survival function for the non-maintained group. And it, it, like I said, it's literally estimating it separately in the two groups because the time points across the two groups are different. So you'll see them dropping at different points in time because the event times are different between the two groups, okay? We can see this in a graph. So I'm just gonna stick km.x inside a plot again. Um, one thing you should know though, is that the confidence intervals are not gonna be appear if you plot more than one curve. So you have to request them specifically when you're plotting two or more curves. All right, so I add cont.int equals true to plot, uh, put the confidence intervals back. I also ask for two different colors, otherwise they're both gonna be printed in black so that I can distinguish between the two. Red is, comes first here, so it's the first group, which is the maintained group. The second group is non-maintained. So red is the maintained group, blue is the non-maintained group. As we said before, median survival is right here at 0.5. And you can see that it's earlier for the blue curve than it is for the red curve, right? Here it's at day, I think it was day 23 here and a day 81 right here, or 31, excuse me, here, right? So in general, the red curve has better survival than the blue curve. Um, one thing I wanna say is that for those of you that know about generic functions, plot is a generic function. Generic functions, call other functions when they detect a specific kind of object. So whenever plot detects that it's getting a surfit object, meaning an object that I've created by the surfit function, it actually calls something called plot.surfit. So the option cont.int is actually an option for plot.surfit. Okay. Okay. Now again, these survival graphs are a little bit bare bones. Um, and these are the ones created by the survival pack and specifically by plot.surfit. And it uses base R graphics. So there's a limited uh, amount of custom, customiz customizability, excuse me, of these survival plots. You might want a lot more. And one package that can do that for you is the serve minor package. And serve minor actually leverages the graphical power of ggplot. It adds a lot of its own features so that you can really make very nice, pretty customizable survival plots, okay? We're specifically gonna be using the ggserveplot function from serve minor. And if you supply it that same object as before, it'll produce, um, this was the object where we wanted Kaplan Meyer stratified by the, the treatment variable. And we just used it on plot here. Now we're gonna supply it to ggserveplot and this is the resulting plot. For those of you that use ggplot a lot, you'll recognize this as the ggplot colors. But already for me, it's a lot easier to tell what's going on in this plot than this plot, right? The confidence intervals are a little confusing to see here. It's just a little hard to understand what's going on. Much easier to tell what's going on here. One thing you'll notice is that it automatically adds the censoring indicators, which is these little pluses here. So whenever there's a plus, that means somebody left the risk set due to censoring. You'll notice again, though, that whenever they're censoring, it doesn't necessarily change the survival estimate, right? 
survival stays the same, even though somebody left through the sensor. One nice thing that ggserveplot does is it adds making, uh, it, add, it makes adding a risk table to the plot very easy. So I have this option risk.table equals true. And you'll see it adds this part. This tells you how many people are still at risk at each time point. And people really like this because it, it gives you an idea of how much data there is, right? By nature, survival analysis has less and less data as time progresses. So for instance, all of this data past time 45-ish is based on one subject right here, all of this right here. So that's why there's just gigantic confidence interval because it's just one subject. And so uh, this at-risk table is very useful. You often see it with the survival curves. So if you like it, look into serve minor. Uh, for those of you that use ggplot2 a lot, you can pass a lot of your ggplot2 arguments directly to ggserveplot. So if you want to change the palette, for instance, or the size of the lines, or the actual theme, right? The, this is a overall look of the plot. I don't, you know, this is not a ggplot seminar, so I'm not going to go into any details about what's happening here. But these are all arguments to ggplot functions. And underneath the hood, ggserveplot is really running ggplot. Okay. So you can, you can have all these ggplot arguments and just pass them directly through ggserveplot. And it's really good at knowing what to do. All right. I, it's, it's actually very smart. Okay. If you like using gg, uh, ggplot syntax, you can actually extract the plot itself using dollar sign plot and then use traditional ggplot syntax too. Again, I have no time to go over this syntax, but I'm gonna, <laughs> we have a nice little coincidence. Next week at this time, the very same time, uh, one o'clock Pacific, uh, Siavash Jalal, who is here answering your chat questions, will be leading a seminar teaching ggplot. So come back next week, same time, if you wanna learn about ggplot. Okay, so this is a uh, graphing to compare. And you know, based on these graphs, there's a lot of overlap between, for instance, the confidence intervals here. Doesn't look like, even though there's some separation between the curves, there's probably not enough data to actually tell whether they're different or not. But we often um, wanted to, I'm sorry, yes. Sorry, sorry. Exactly in line that what you were talking, somebody asked uh, the confidence intervals for maintained and non-maintained groups are overlapping greatly. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that statistically the two groups are not very different? And uh, I had a client a few days ago asking the same question. I think it's a good time to explain that the overlapping confidence that doesn't mean yes. they are not different. Okay, good. So yeah, the question is, is, you know, in this picture, we can see that there's a good deal of overlap in the 95% comp confidence intervals for the survival estimates for the maintained and non-maintained groups. And the question is, can we infer something about significance from this? And the general answer is if, if there's overlap and it's just partially overlapping, the answer is no, it's pretty hard to tell. Um, if the overlap includes the estimate of the other interval, like the center of the other interval is contained in the interval. So if the interval of A contains B, the center of the B interval, then they probably are not different. But if there's only some partial overlap, you can't tell. If they are completely non-overlapping, they are gonna be statistically significantly different P at P uh, equal 0.05, but if they are somewhat overlapping, you really can't tell. So in general, if they're overlapping, I would say it's dangerous to make conclusions based on it. You're really only safe when they're completely non-overlapping. Okay, and, it's generally and, better to, yes, I'm sorry. sorry. Right, right. I, I just wanted to add that these confidence interval are for each time point. Yes. When we compare to survival graph, we compare overall. Yes. The yes. difference between these two, that is correct. two functions. That's right. So we're, we're now going to be moving on to a test 
whether these two curves are different and is assessing the overall curve, not any particular time point here. So generally we do not test whether two groups are different at a particular time point. There are reasons for this, uh, but we usually test the entire curve against each other. One reason is because of something called proportional hazard. But anyways, before we get there, um, you might just have the overall question, are these two, two curves different? And we can uh, state a formal hypothesis that the null is that the two curves are equivalent, and that the alternative is that the two curves are not equivalent. And the log rank statistic is one popular method to evaluate this hypothesis. Under the null, the log rank statistic is chi-square distributed with g minus one degrees of freedom. So G is the number of groups. So if there's two groups, it'll have one degree of freedom, all right? So it's just a chi-square statistic. Basically, it's testing if I made a combined curve with the, is the number of people that leave at each time point about the same between the two groups. And we can test whether the, people, the number of people that leave at each time point is the same, at, is the same between the two groups using this chi-square statistic, okay? So, I'm going to use the serve diff function, and the serve diff function with no extra options or arguments is going to perform this log rank test. So I put in my typical model formula, and then I want to test across this variable, right? I want to say test the survival function for differences across this variable. X variable is the chemotherapy treatment, right? And so here it reports the results, and then here is your chi square statistic and your p value. In this case, there's some evidence that the curves may be different. And again, it's testing the curves as a whole, not any particular time point. Um, and so here it's you know getting, approaching 0.05. So there's some evidence they may be different, but not very strong. Um, now, there are modifications of this log rank test. Uh, and these modifications use weights. And I don't want to go into a lot of details because it's a little confusing but there's this argument called rho, and rho ranges between zero and one. And the higher rho is, the closer to one it is, the more weight is put on earlier time points, okay? And usually, if there's any time point we wanna weight strongly, it's the early ones. And that's because, number one, there's usually more data in the beginning time, right? So we often want to put more weight where there's more data. And number two, a lot of times the early time is the really critical time that we care about. So for instance, if we're looking at survival after surgery, it's that time right after surgery that we really care about survival, on, you know, because surgery is a high risk procedure. And so there's an elevated risk of death right after surgery. And so a lot of times you want to, you know, really emphasize the beginning of the follow-up time and put less emphasis on the end. If you want to emphasize Early time points more, put rho closer to one. When rho is equal to zero, it actually treats all the time points equally, which is what the log rank, log rank test is. So the log rank test treats all time points and weights them equally, but there are modifications where you can weight earlier time points more. So here I add rho equals one, which is the maximum value of rho, which puts as much weight on the early time points as possible, and our inferences are not really any different. Okay, um, that happens a lot, you know, um, that your inferences are going to be the same no matter what weights you choose. Okay, so let me pause. Are there any questions about um, Kaplan Meier estimation or this log rank test that we've discussed so far? If there are, feel free to ask while we're doing this exercise. Um, let's start. I want to give you some time to practice. Um, doing these things together. So we're going to be using the veteran data set. And this data set describes survival times for veterans with lung cancer. And our variables are, we have a time variable that records survival time, a status variable that's coded zero for centered and one, in, one equals dead. And we have a treatment variable that's one equals standard and two equals test. Okay. So it's pretty similar to the AML data set that we just used. Um, I want you to create a graph 
and a table of the Kaplan-Meier estimated survival function for the entire data set. And then what is the median survival time? For this first exercise, I'm just gonna ask one question at a time, then we'll go over it so that you're all following together. So let's take like one minute, see if you can create a graph and a table of the Kaplan-Meier estimated survival function for the entire data set. And then also try to uh, get what the median survival time is. All right, let's go ahead and take one minute to do that. It's okay if you don't finish in time, we'll go over it together in one minute. The data sets, as, as long as you have survival loaded, these are all data sets in the survival package. And again, if you feel a little lost, don't worry. After one minute, I'll do this first exercise with you. And I think you'll find it maybe you'll get your bearings after we do this, okay? But just look at the code from the earlier slides to provide you enough guidance so that you can do these things. Okay, 15 more seconds or so. Sorry about that. Okay, let's pause and do this first one together. Okay, so I'm just gonna start a new one. Um, if you haven't already, you're gonna need survival. Okay. Um, Actually, I'll go ahead and load the other ones too. Okay, so for this one, uh, to create the graph and the plot, basically we need to first run serve fit, right? So I'm just gonna save uh, km, let's say dot vet, okay? And then I'm gonna run serve fit, okay? That is to do the Kaplan-Meier estimation. And then I have to do the formula, right? The formula starts with capital S serve, and then inside serve, we have time, and then status, right? First the time variable, then the status variable, okay? And outside that, we're gonna put a tilde, and then a one for the entire data set, and then we're gonna say data equals AML. Okay. So that is just to get the estimates itself. Now, to graph it, we just put it inside a plot. Right. That will plot it. This is the Kaplan-Meier estimate of the survival function. And then if I want a table, I just put it inside of tidy. All right, and for tidy, you will need broom. Broom. Okay. And then tidy. Oops, I didn't capitalize my M here me, we'll produce this table of the Kaplan-Meier estimate, okay? And then if you want median survival, you just print out the graphic itself. Okay, and so here, sorry, I can't see. Uh, the median survival is 27 days. So if I looked at this graph, this 0.5 mark is around 27 days. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> So oh, sorry, yes, data should be better in. See, these have the exact same variable name, so it works. Thank you so much, that was a big mistake. Um, okay, let's replace that with better in and redo it. Thank you. Better in UC has more data. So the Kaplan-Meier curve has, is much smoother looking because there's more data in the better end, like I said. Uh, you'll have more, you can see that the time points are closer together and that gives it a smoother appearance. Right, but the same, all the same functions, you wanna plot it with plot, create the table with tidy, and then median um, event time is 80, 80 days. Now for part two, I want you to create a graph of the Kaplan-Meier estimated survival function stratified by treatment. 
add 95% confidence intervals and color the two functions. The survival appeared different for the two treatment groups. Okay, let's take another, let's say 45 seconds for that one. So just create a graph stratified by treatment, add confidence intervals and color the two lines, whatever two colors you want. Then try to assess for yourself, do the two treatments appear different? Okay, again, if taking you longer to do this, that's okay, maybe your first time. All right, so now we just wanna stratify by treatment. So I'm gonna copy the original surf fit. We just need to change it. I'm gonna change the name from vet to treat like this. And instead of the one, I'm gonna put treat. Okay, that's all we need to do. Then you plot it. Lost my end parentheses, excuse me. Again, okay. Then uh, you can plot it either with plot. So if you use plot, you could have done this. Then you would still need to ask for the confidence intervals. And then the colors, you could specify any two colors you want. Let's say I want red and green this time. Okay, you could do that. Or you could have done ggserve plot, am.treat, and all you'd have to do is content.true here. It'll automatically color them for you. Either one would be true. Now, looking at these two graphs, do you think that these two look different or not? If you want to just put yes or no in the chat, what did you think? Do they look different to you? Not different? Anybody have a guess? Different, all right, we have one different. Some people think different, not different. All right, well, let's use the next step to help us out. Use the log rank test to provide more evidence for your assessment of the survival of two groups. So now run the log rank test to test whether those two curves are different. Okay, let's take 30 seconds to do that. Okay, all right, this one is one command. So for the test, log rank test, we're gonna use serve diff. And we just put the exact same specification that we do inside serve fit. The model formula and then the data set. Here, it appears that there's not much evidence that they're different. So. Um, one thing that happens here is that the curves actually cross too. So even though there look to be some differences kind of in the middle, since again, it's looking at the whole curve, whole curves are not different enough for it to determine that they're different. So yes, this p-value is quite a bit above 0.05, so we would not conclude that they're different. Okay, um, any questions up to this point? What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a break. Um, we're gonna come back at 2.30, and then the second half of the course is gonna be all on Cox modeling, okay? I'm gonna take a very quick break myself, but I'll be back in less than a minute, and then I'll be here to answer any questions until we restart again at 2.30, okay? So let's take a break. Okay, we are gonna move on now to Cox modeling. Okay, so I know a lot of you don't have background in the Cox proportional hazards model according to the poll at the beginning, so I'll try to take it slow. We wanna change gears now. So previously we, we were using the Kaplan-Meier estimator to uh, estimate the survival function. Now we want to 
concentrate on the hazard function. So um, the COPS model can estimate, sorry, COPS model can estimate the effects of multiple predictors on the hazard function, all right? And throughout this workshop, I'm going to be using the words predictor and covariate interchangeably. Um, there is no distribution that is assumed for survival times. Um, I'm sorry, I should say that the Cox model is very, very popular. And one reason why it's popular is because that there is no assumption about the distribution of survival times. So for instance, you know, when we do no linear regression, we assume that the errors are normally distributed. Or if we use Poisson regression, we assume that the outcome is Poisson distributed. For the Cox model, we, have to, we don't have to make any of those kinds of assumptions. Another reason for popularity is that it naturally accommodates right censoring and time varying covariates. It also can be extended in many, many ways. Uh, for instance, it can accommodate time varying coefficients which means that the effect of predictors is, are allowed to change over time with the extension. We can also extend it to include random effects, uh, which are often called frailties. And this is used to model recurrent events or for cluster data. Uh, we can also extend the Cox model for competing risks. Um, I'm not, unfortunately not gonna be talking about any of these extensions today, uh, but just know that the Cox model is very flexible and that's one reason why it's so very, very popular. Okay, so the model itself, let's take a look. So for simplicity, we're gonna begin with a Cox model with a single time constant predictor, X1. Um, so on the left side is what we're trying to estimate. And this is the hazard at time T given the subject has covariate X1 equal to little X1. So Big X1 is the name of the variable. Little X1 is the value that it takes on, all right? So we wanna know what is the hazard for somebody who has big X1 equal to little X1 at time T. And that is equal to um, the baseline hazard at time T times the exponentiation of B1, a regression coefficient times that value X1. I'm sorry, there is a question of whether there'll be workshops on those extensions. Maybe if that, that is the ideal and hopefully we will get there someday. The Cox model uh, does use failure time. So the data are the same as they are for Captain Meyer estimation. The data are exactly the same, but it's not modeling survival directly. It's modeling the hazard. Actually, it's really modeling effects on the hazard. All of this might become clearer, hopefully, as I proceed through this explanation. All right, but we're now modeling the hazard. Remember way back, way back before here, we were talking about the hazard function, right? Cox is modeling effects on this hazard function. Remember though, that we discussed how the hazard function determines the cumulative hazard function and that the cumulative hazard function has a direct relationship with survival. So if we model effects on the hazard function, we're also modeling effects on the survival function. But the Cox model models the hazard function directly, okay. or effects on the hazard function. So again, this H0T is called the baseline hazard at time T, all right? Now, this would be the hazard for somebody who has zero on all the covariates. So for somebody who has X1 equal to zero, that's what H0T is. It would be the hazard at time T for somebody who has zero on X1. And then the other part is EXP B1 X1. This, all of that together is gonna to be a hazard ratio, okay? And it, um, that quantity compares the hazard for this person who has big X1 equal to little X1 to the person that has zero on X1, all right? So this hazard ratio compares somebody who has little X1 to somebody who has zero. Okay, I know that's a little abstract. Let me make it more concrete. For example, imagine that X1 is a treatment variable with the values X1 equals treatment, X, I'm sorry, X equals, X1 equals one for treatment and X1 equals zero for control. 
So the hazard at time for treatment, hazard at time t for somebody in treatment would be, it's H zero t times exp b one times one, right? We just substitute in the value for x one. And that's just gonna be exp b one. So just keep this as is for now. Now we can do the same thing for control. Uh, the hazard at time t for x1 equals zero. Now we just replace little x1 with zero. If I multiply those together, the inside is zero. Taking any number to the zero power is equal to one, right? So exp zero is equal to one. So that just leaves this, okay? So this is the expression for somebody who has a one on x1. And this is the expression of the hazard for somebody who has zero. And like I said, the, has, the baseline hazard function is the hazard for somebody who has zero on all the covariates, okay? We can compare these two hazards as a ratio, right? I'm gonna call it a hazard ratio HR. So I'm gonna take the hazard for somebody who has X1 equals one in treatment. I'm gonna put that over the hazard for somebody in control, hazard for treatment over hazard for control. And then I'm gonna replace that with these two expressions. That leaves me with this. And then the two baseline hazard functions cancel. And this is very important. Uh, and this is one of the key attractive properties of the, of the Cox model is this cancellation. I'll get to that in a minute. But what's left over is expb one And as I said before, this is the hazard ratio. It, is an expression of the ratio of the hazard for treatment to the ratio, to, it's a ratio of the hazard of treatment to the hazard for controls, okay? So for instance, if EXPB1 equals 0.25, the way that I would interpret that is that the treatment group has one quarter the hazard of the control group. Or another way I can say that, is that the treatment group has a 75% decrease in the hazard compared to controls. So if the hazard is lower, remember that the hazard and survival have inverse relationship. So if one group has a lower hazard, they'll have better survival. So here, the treatment group has a lower hazard. So in general, we would expect the treatment group to have better survival. Um, here, on the other hand, we have a hazard ratio equal to two. And here, uh, we would interpret that to mean that the hazard for the treatment group is twice the hazard of the control group. And again, whoever has the higher hazard has worse survival. So in this case, we would say that treatment has worse survival than the controls, okay? All right, so again, just, it's a little, you're gonna to have to train your brain to think going up on the hazard means going down in survival, okay? Um, so there's been the question about whether or not the Cox model is using survival times and whether it's modeling the distribution of survival times. Those are different questions. The first, the answer to the first question is yes, the data are still, survival time data. So you'll still use data where you have a variable that records how long somebody survived before they experienced the event or their censoring time. Just like we can infer survival functions from survival times, we can infer the hazard function from survival times because of this direct relationship between them. Because of this relationship, we can get from survival to hazard and vice versa. Basically, once we know one of them, once we know the hazard, we know survival. Once we know survival, we know the hazard and so on. So we are still using the exact same data. It's gonna be structured just like this for the Cox model. But because of the direct relationship between the hazard and survival, by modeling one, we're essentially modeling the other one. No, that is a very good question. Um, the question is, when the hazard is double, can we say that survival is halved? And that is not true. It's not clear. Remember, it's the cumulative hazard that really, really determines survival, not instantaneous hazard. So no, it won't work out that neatly. 
the layperson definition of a hazard is just the rate at which events occur per unit time. So for instance, if the hazard uh, for the control group is 10 deaths per year, if the hazard ratio is two, then the hazard rate for the controls might be five per year, in other words, right? So five deaths per year is the hazard for controls and a hazard ratio of two would mean that treatment has 10 deaths per year. So hazard is events per unit time. In this case, I said deaths per year. Yep, you got it. Okay, and hopefully you can see that with higher event rates, more events will be expected. With more events expected, there will be less survival. I know it's, it takes a while to train your brain to think in that way. Trust me, it took me a while to get there too, but you'll get there. Okay, so in general, if you exponentiate a regression coefficient, remember the B1s are what we're gonna be estimating in the Cox model. In general, when you exponentiate those, those are hazard ratios that express the ratio increase in the hazard for a one unit increase in the predictor. Okay. Um, the hazard function, the exponential function of hazard is flat. Yes. The hazard is flat, okay, but the survival function is exponential. Okay, so this is the flat hazard. This flat hazard leads to this red curve, and this is an exponential curve right here. So constant hazard leads to exponentially distributed survival times. Everything I said right now, you don't actually have to know for to use the Cox model though. The Cox model does not make any assumptions about distribution, so we don't even care if they're exponentially distributed or not, okay? But yes, when I say the distribution of survival times, exponential is one of those distributions, um, but again, this, uh, the uh, Cox model doesn't actually care. Okay, so hopefully you understand what hazard ratio means. It's the ratio of the hazard function between two groups usually, or two, two subjects. Now, many of you have heard about that the Cox model assumes what's called proportional hazards. And this means that the hazard ratio is constant over time. In other words, that the effect of that covariate is constant over time, okay? Uh, another way of saying this in our example of treatment is that we would say that the treatment effect does not change over time. Okay, that's what proportional hazards mean. It means that the hazard ratio does not depend on time. So previously, this was our expression for the hazard ratio. It's just you exponentiate the Cox regression coefficient. Notice that there's no time in here at all. So what this means is that this hazard ratio is the same no matter what time we're looking at. So it's the same at day one as it is at day 200. Okay, this is the assumption of the proportional hazard model. And you, you, you'll need to check it because it may or may not be true, okay? So it's important for me to, I know this is gonna get confusing. Proportional hazards does not mean that the hazard function itself is not changing, okay? The hazard can change over time. It can still be increasing. What proportional hazards means is that if you compare two hazards, their ratio is the same no matter what time point you're looking at. So here's an example of two hazards that are changing over time, right? They're both increasing over time. In other words, as time progresses, there are more deaths, of the, there are more events expected per day, okay? So the hazard is changing, but the ratio between them is not changing, right? Here it's at 0.1 and here it's at 0.5. So the hazard of the red is double the hazard of the blue at day 500. Well, here it's at 0.5 and here it's at 0.025. It's also double here. I set this up to be proportional. So at every point in time here, the estimate on the red curve is always double the estimate on the blue curve, all right? So this is what we call proportional hazard. When you have proportional hazards, the corresponding survival functions are what they call sometimes parallel, right? 
it's not really parallel because they're curves, but they won't cross. If you don't, if you have proportional hazards, these two curves will never cross. This parallelism between the curves is easier to see if you plot the negative log of the negative log of survival. So I'm literally taking these numbers here, taking the log of those numbers, multiplying it times negative one, taking the log of those numbers and multiplying it by negative one again. It's not that important you understand how this works. But basically, if you plot the negative log of the negative log of survival of these two groups, that's where you can actually see the parallelism. So the vertical distance between these two curves is exactly the same across time. It does not, it does not change. So this is what's meant by proportional hazards. It's again, if we look at negative log, negative log survival, that the vertical distance is the same. You don't have to know, you know necessarily all this detail, but I just wanted you to get an idea that proportional hazards means that the, the effect of the covariate does not change over time and it results in parallel curves. Here's an example of non-proportional hazards. So here, these are clearly two hazards whose ratio is not constant over time. In fact, it, it changes direction, right? Um, so here, the blue is higher than the red. And after day 100, the red is higher than the blue. So this is definitely not proportional hazards because the ratio of blue to red changes with time. When the hazards are not proportional, survival curves will often cross like this, okay? And then also if you plot negative log, negative log survival, they'll also cross. But again, the key here is that the vertical distance between these two curves is not the same, which means they're not parallel. And that happens when you have non-proportional hazards like this, okay? So this is the assumption of the Cox model is that the effect of your covariates do not change over time. And this is expressed as a constant hazard ratio. If you don't account for non-constant hazard ratios, in other words, if you have violation of proportional hazards, this threatens the validity of all of your Cox model estimates. So just like everything else, you really do need to check this assumption in order for you to be confident that your results are valid, okay? One nice thing though, is that if you do have a violation, there are ways to accommodate it within the Cox model. So you don't have to go on and move on to something else. You can still use the Cox model, but it has a particular extension that you need to use. There's any questions about proportional hazards? I know we're getting a little technical, but hopefully it's making some sense. Just think of proportional hazards as, again, the effect of this predictor does not change over time. Uh, the hazard ratio would is defined as EXPV1. For hazard ratio to be a slope line means that EXPV1 is changing with time. Is that understand? Yes, that is correct. That is correct. So if EXPV1 is changing with time, that means that it, uh, you do not have proportional hazards. Okay. Um, previously, I mentioned the baseline hazard function. One reason why the Cox model is so popular is that you actually don't have to specify what this H0T thing is, this baseline hazard function. And again, the baseline hazard function is the hazard function for a subject with zero on all the covariates. And it's directly used in the model, the, um, the Cox model. It's right here in the Cox model. But what's cool is that you don't actually have to know what this is. It all cancels out. All the calculations using this cancel out. So you actually don't need to know what it is. Well, what does this mean? Essentially, this means that we don't have to know anything about the hazard or about the distribution of survival time to use the Cox model. In other words, you don't have to know if the hazard is increasing over time, if it's constant, if it's decreasing, if it has you know, a squiggly shape or any other kind of shape. It doesn't matter. Cox model doesn't care. So you don't have to know this. And you don't have to know the distribution of survival times. You don't have to know what the survival curve looks like either. The Cox model estimates are valid regardless. So that's one of the reasons why it's so popular. One of the things that, you know, as analysts we struggle with is figuring out what is the distribution of my outcome. And many times we don't know. And so what's great is that you don't have to know for Cox. You can just keep going. So 
if we did assume a distribution of survival times, for instance, we would have to estimate parameters to characterize that distribution. We would characterize like the mean and maybe some, maybe like the variance of that distribution, for instance. But since we're not assuming any distribution, we don't have to estimate parameters that describe that distribution. Instead, the only parameters that we're gonna be estimating are the regression parameters that are hazard ratios, okay? So we don't estimate anything that determines the shape of these hazard functions or the shape of the survival curve. The only thing we estimate are the differences between subjects who have different covariate values. And this is why the Cox model is called semi-parametric. The only parameters we're estimating are the parameters that express the differences between hazard functions. In other words, the hazard ratios. We don't care about the parameters that determine the shape of the hazard function, for instance. Practically, what this means is that when you look at the output of your Cox model, you're not gonna find an intercept or a constant there like you would in other regression models. It's just gonna be gone, okay? There's a price for this though. The price for not estimating the baseline hazard function is that the Cox model does not directly estimate either the hazard function or the survival function. It only estimates the covariate effects. So in other words, if you're looking at like, let's, let's, let's pretend we had a different variable like weight. It would be as if we're not actually trying to predict somebody's weight itself. We're only interested in the effects on weight. So like the effect of gender on weight, we're interested in that, but we don't need to know somebody's actual weight. We just need to know the coefficients that compare weights of different groups. Okay, so the same idea here. We don't wanna, with Cox model, we can't actually technically predict actual survival what we can, or actual hazard. We can only compare hazards, okay? So you only wanna use the Cox model really when you're interested in comparing uh, the effects of, when you're interested in estimating the effects of these covariates or your predictions. That's what it's really for, okay? Now I can then add multiple predictors. Everything I said before still applies. I can exponentiate each one of these and then each one of these will express a hazard ratio for that particular variable, right? So, each, each variable gets its own coefficient, which when exponentiated becomes x. Okay. okay, I know that was a very quick introduction to the Cox model. Are there any questions? Just keep in mind, the main point here is that with the Cox model, we're only gonna be estimating hazard ratios basically, not the actual hazard itself, just the hazard ratios. Any questions? Just to correct one of the, my uh, response. Yes. I, I responded quickly. The hazard uh, base, base. Baseline hazard base and, Yes, is not the hazard at time zero. It's hazard mm -hmm. for all the predictor to be at zero. It has the same interpretation as the intercept same in a regular thing. regression model. It is the, so remember the intercept in your regular regression model is the expected outcome for somebody who has zero on all the predictors. It's the same thing here. This is a hazard estimate, which is the outcome for somebody who has zero on all the predictors again. Yeah. Another Not question easy. was, another question was hazard ratio corresponds to odds ratio. Yes. It's not ex I mean, in, yeah. in the sense that- It's not that exactly, it but it's yeah. similar. Yeah. It's very similar in the sense that it expresses the effect of a covariate um, as a ratio. So yes, um, but imagine in the logistic regression model, we didn't, we didn't estimate the intercept. We only estimated the odds ratios. That's what we're doing here. Just like that, if we didn't estimate the intercept in logistic regression, we can't actually predict somebody's actual probability or actual odds. Same here, we, without the baseline hazard function, we can't actually predict we can't predict somebody's actual hazard. What we can predict though, is how much bigger their hazard is than somebody else's. So if that's what you care about, effects of predictors, the Cox model is good. Okay. And to add, uh, we assume that log of hazard has a linear relationship with predictors. Yes, 
So that's correct. So the, we assume that the log of the hazard rate has a linear relationship with the predictors. That's correct. In the Cox model, the shape of the house is immaterial as long as the predictor moves. Is this, yes, that is the baseline is of note. The baseline, I mean, I, <laughs> the baseline is not specified. In other words, yeah, it just cancels out of all of the calculations, but you are right. The shape of the hazard function doesn't matter. The Cox model is only interested in comparing hazard functions between subjects. Okay, yes. Okay, so we're gonna be using a new data set for our Cox modeling. We're gonna be using the lung data set, which is all the data sets here are in the survival package. So as long as you have survival loaded, you'll have all the data. Um, the data describe survival of patients with advanced lung cancer. Okay, so the variables we're gonna be using are time, which is survival time in days. We have a status variable again, where one is, this time is a one, two. So one is censored, two is dead. Remember that serve is okay with this kind of one, two, as long as one means censored and two is dead. We have age and years. Typically, if you have an age variable, it's going to be age at baseline. You really, you usually can't use age as a time varying covariate because it perfectly tracks with time. And so it will have too much dependency. Um, so usually you can only use like age at the beginning of uh, the follow up time. Then we have a sex variable, which is coded one, two here. I don't want to go into too much technical detail, but generally, if we have a binary covariate, we would recommend that you code it zero, one. Because if you don't code it zero, one, then the intercept doesn't have an actual interpretation that makes sense. However, because in the Cox model, there is no intercept, it's fine to leave it at one, two. Okay. Uh, and then we also have a weight loss, which is a continuous predictor, which measures the weight loss in pounds in the last six months. And so we're interested to know whether age, sex, and weight loss affect the hazard and therefore affect survival. Okay. And we're going to be using a Cox model to estimate the effects of each of those three variables on the hazard. Okay, so to fit the Cox model, you're gonna use the Cox pH function from survival. And the first argument is the formula, which is a typical R regression formula. And your typical R regression formula has the outcome on the left of the tilde, and then a series of predictors separated by plus um, on the right side. I mean, you can also have just one predictor or you can have a one, although the one here, never mind. Never mind about the one. You cannot have a one here because there's no intercept. But you could have a single predictor, for instance, if you want. Here's an example, okay? So again, Cox pH is the Cox fitting function in survival. The left side is our serve specification for the outcome. First is the time variable, then the status variable. Tilde, then the predictors, separated by plus. Age, sex, weight loss, comma, then the data set. We're gonna save that in a model object here because we can do a lot of other things with this model object. One thing we can do is put it inside summary, and then we'll get a summary of the results. Okay, so this is what you get at a summary. There's a lot to look at here. First is N, this is the number of subjects, and then this is the number of events. Always look at this, all right? Make sure that this is the number of events you expect. For instance, you might have a variable that's coded zero for the event and one for sensor. If you didn't catch that, this number will be wrong. So you need to make sure that you have the correct number of events. Always check. Now, these are the three predictors. This first column coef are the Bs, right? B1, B2, B3. These are the regression coefficients. These are interpreted as log hazard ratios, okay? It's hard to, to describe, or people have a hard time interpreting log hazard ratios. So in general, you can just look at the sign. If it's positive, that means that the uh, increases in this variable increase the hazard. And if it's negative, it means increases in this variable lower the hazard. So, in, so older patients or patients who are older at the beginning of follow-up time will generally have a higher hazard. 
if they have a higher hazard, they will have a lower survival. Similarly, females are two, males are one. So females have a lower hazard than males by quite a bit actually. And similarly, weight loss has maybe a very, very, very small effect. If so, it's positive. Okay, so this is the log hazard ratio of the beads itself. EXP coef is the, are the hazard ratio, right? So these are usually what most people interpret because their interpretation is very similar to odds ratios. Um, so for instance, for age, we can say that for each additional year of increase of age at baseline, the hazard increases by about 2.03% or so, okay? Or by a factor of 1.0203, right? Then for this one, this is the hazard ratio comparing females to males. For this one, females are in the numerator, males are in the denominator. We would say that females have 60% the hazard that males do. Or we would say that females have a 40% decrease in the hazard compared to males. Since females have a lower hazard than males, we would say that females have better survival. Okay, train your brain to think in the opposite direction, hazard survival. Females have lower hazard, which means they have higher survival. Okay, weight loss again, if it's anything, more weight loss leads to more hazard, but it's questionable whether there's any effect, it's tiny. Okay, so that's the hazard ratios. Then you have the standard error of the original unexponentiated coefficients here. The Z statistic used to test whether um, the null hypotheses for these coefficients and then the p-value. So the specifically, the test here is whether the coefficient is equal to zero, meaning no change in the log hazard, or whether the hazard ratio is equal to one. Those are equivalent, right? If you exponentiate zero, you get one. So this p-value reflects a test of whether these coefficients are equal to zero, or equivalently, whether these exponentiated coefficients are equal to one. Okay, then you get the confidence interval for the hazard ratio here. So this is the confidence interval for the hazard ratio. So if it contains one, that would usually mean that P is greater than 0.05. So P is greater than 0.05 for weight loss, and we can see that its hazard ratio confidence interval contains one. Okay. Um, the last part, this is the concordance statistic. It is a measure of model fitness or model, yeah, goodness of fit for the model. The higher it is, the closer to one, the better. I don't have, it's, I don't have time to the right today to actually describe its calculation, but just know that you want this close, as close to one as possible. And then these are um, tests of the model overall. And these are joint tests of whether any of these three coefficients are equal to zero, all right? So some of you um, know this as omnibus test of the whole model. Um, generally, if these p-values are greater than 0.05, the model, we declare the model not very useful. Okay, any questions about the Cox pH output? I know it's a lot, so I wanna make sure we are somewhat uh, comfortable. There's a question, does it make sense to standardize predictors in order to assess the magnitude of the effects expressed through log hazard ratio co coefficients. I suppose if you wanted to compare the magnitude of the coefficients, the effects, it might make sense to standardize the predictors, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you can tidy, uh, sorry, what would the difference be between this analysis and doing a logistic regression predicting survival at the end of a time frame? Well, um, but just, okay, so if you included time, um, that's one thing. So, I mean, first of all, logistic regression doesn't necessarily look at the timing of the event. It just looks at whether the event occurred at all during the follow-up time. So if you don't include time in the logistic regression, it's, it's a kind of a different question because, you know, in logistic regression, if you don't, if you ignore time, let's say in the treatment group, everybody fails really early, or let, let me reverse that. In the treatment group, everybody fails really late. And in the control group, everybody fails really early. 
If you look at logistic regression, where you're only looking at whether people failed or not, the two groups will look the same if you don't include time in that model. But the Cox model will be able to tell that, oh yeah, all the treatment people failed a lot later, so there is an effect on the hazard. So if you don't include time in your logistic regression model, it is a completely different question. However, there are survival models that can be run as logistic regression models. If you look up something called discrete time survival, um, those are actually logistic regression models. And they are, have very similar usages as the Cox model. Um, so if you wanna do that, um, look into that. Another thing that logistic regression doesn't handle very well is censoring. Um, you can just say that the person didn't experience the event at the end, but that's, it handles it differently than survival would. So there are definitely some differences there, but there are ways to make logistic regression very similar to survival analysis. And the main way is that you have to include time. You have to structure your data in a certain way and you need to include time in the logistic regression model. Okay. All right, so if you wanted just a really uh, clean table of results, you can put the output of OxPH inside of tidy. Um, if you say exponentiate equals true, it'll re return your hazard ratios and then the confidence intervals for the hazard ratios. Um, so for instance, here I put lung.cox again, is the, is the object returned by Cox pH. I'm putting into tidy, all right? And then re results is this table. This table, again, is an actually a data frame, right? So these are the columns of the data frame. And you can see that these are the hazard ratios, and I have like their, uh, their standard errors and their confidence intervals. For instance, one nice thing about this is that you can make a plot of the coefficients using this data set. For instance, I'm not going to go into the code here, but this is just a plot of the hazard ratios with their confidence intervals. And I have um, a uh, reference line here at one, which shows that you know if the confidence interval for the hazard ratio contains one, this would not be judged statistically significant. Okay, so you see, I see these kinds of plots in many different publications. You know, it's very useful when you have lots and lots of predictors, and you want to see um, which ones seem to have significant effects. But the point here I'm trying to make though is that Tidy stores these model results as a data set, which then you can use very easily to um, create these kinds of graphs. So the question is why is Cox popular? Is it better to have parametric assumption uh, than non or semi-parametric model. Well, if you know what the actual distribution should be, yes, you're right, it's better. Because then you can actually predict survival directly from your model. You can have smooth survival curves, right? Instead of these little jagged step functions. So yes, it's true. If you actually know what the hazard function should look like and what the then survival um, distribution should be, it is better to use parametric models. But most people don't know. We don't really know what the hazard function looks like, nor do we know what the distribution of survival times should be. So when we don't know, it's better not to make assumptions and then use the Cox model. The Cox model has been shown to get very accurate estimates of the effects under many different assumed distributions without having to, without having to know what those distributions are. So when you don't know what the distribution is, it's probably better to use Cox because it produces very good estimates under many different conditions. If you assume the wrong distribution and then run a parametric model, you could get estimates that are way off. And that's less likely to happen with Cox. So it's really just, it's much safer choice when you don't know what the distribution is. And that's why it is so popular. You know. Um, a lot of researchers don't have, you know, professional statisticians with them, and they're very uncomfortable, you know, trying to make assumptions about distributions. And so, 
you know, Cox model is very, very popular in the medical field. And a lot of those, you know, medical researchers don't have statisticians working with them. So I'm sure a lot of them don't wanna make these kinds of assumptions. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I've been talking about how you can't make predictions directly from a Cox model. And that is true. It's still possible to get survival function predictions after running a Cox model, but the way we're doing it is by combining a non-parametric method like Kaplan-Meier with the Cox model. Let me try to explain. So after running this Cox model, you get these hazard ratios, but sometimes you still wanna be able to look at a survival curve. Well, as I said, because we don't have an intercept, we don't have the baseline survival function, uh, the baseline hazard function in the model, we actually can't directly estimate survival or the hazard. So what people do instead is they use a non-parametric method, like kind of like Kaplan-Meier, to estimate the baseline survival function. <clears throat> no, this time I said the baseline survival function, not baseline hazard but it has a similar interpretation. The baseline survival function is the survival function for somebody with zero on all the covariates. So it's the survival curve for somebody who has zero on everything. We can use Kaplan-Meier methods or Kaplan-Meier-like methods to estimate this baseline survival function. Then we can get the survival for somebody who has non-zero covariate values by using this relationship. So we're gonna estimate this S0T using Kaplan-Meier, let's say. Then once I have that S0T, I can get the survival function for anybody with any set of covariate values using this relationship right here. I just take that estimated S0T, and then I take it to the power of the exponentiation of the regression coefficients times the covariates and a linear combination of all those. All right, so I estimate this S0T using Kaplan-Meier, and then I plug in my regression coefficients and then my values on all my covariates, and I can get my survival for anybody using this method. But I wanna emphasize that the baseline survival estimate does not come at all from the Cox model. It comes from something else like Kaplan-Meier, okay? But then we use that baseline survival and our covariate effects, which are hazard ratios, to be able to predict survival for anybody. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Okay, because we estimate the survival function non-parametrically, the, these survival curves that we get after running a Cox model will again be these step functions. Okay, so you can predict survival after a Cox pH model with serve fit again. But instead of just putting serve and then like a tilde one or serve tilde some grouping variable like we did for Kaplan Meier estimates, we're now putting our Cox pH object inside of serve fit. Okay, what I'm doing here, I'm not, I'm gonna recommend you not do, which is don't put anything else. You can do this, but what it will do is it will predict survival for somebody who has the mean value on all the covariates. So remember our covariates here are age, sex, and weight loss. So what it's doing here is it's predicting survival for somebody who has mean age, mean sex, and mean weight loss, okay? And these are the actual survival estimates. Again, for somebody at the mean on all covariates. I'm sorry, I put that in surfit, then I put the resulting surfit object inside a tidy to create the table of the survival, estimated survival function. I can also plot it. So this again is the estimated survival function for somebody who's at the means on all covariates. And I just put the surfit object inside a plot. For those of you that are anticipating things, I can also use ggserve plot for this. I'll get to that in just a minute. As I said, though, I'm not going to re recommend that you use you predict survival for somebody who's at the mean on all covariates because a lot of times that doesn't actually make sense. If you have a factor variable in your data set, factor variables are 
uh, categorical variables. So you may have like a one, two, three, four for race or ethnicity. And uh, the survival package is literally going to take the mean of that one, two, three, four variable. And again, that may make no sense at all. So um, we recommend that you not predict at the mean of all covariates, but specify values at which to predict. In particular here, it really does not make sense to predict survival at the mean of sex. Instead, let's, let's predict survival separately for the two sexes. So what you do is you create a new data set of covariate values at which you want to predict your survival function, okay? So I'm gonna tell it the covariate values I wanted to use for a prediction. So here I'm creating a new data set, I'm calling it plot data. I'm literally just creating it as a data frame. And here I'm saying, I want to have the sexes separated. So I wanna have one row for sex equals one, which is male, and one row for sex equals two, which is female. And then I'm setting age to be the mean age in the data set and weight loss to be the mean weight loss in the data set. So it certainly makes sense to take the mean on co continuous variables, but for categorical variables, it may not make sense. Okay, so, and you, you, know, you may wanna look at specific cutoffs. You may wanna look at age equals 18 or age equals 60. You may wanna look at a specific weight loss of 10 or five pounds, for instance. And you can put all those values in there. It'll predict a survival curve specifically for that kind of person, okay? So now that I've created this data set, I can supply it to serve fit. Okay, so previously I used serve fit without any extra data. Now I'm supplying this new data set plot data to serve fit along with the Cox pH model. Oh yeah, sorry, I'll go over that in just a second. Along with the Cox pH model, then putting all that in serve fit. So now it will predict survival for this kind of person a male with mean age and mean weight loss. And for this kind of person, a female with mean age and mean weight loss. There's a question that was na.rm equals true. Um, the mean function, if it encounters any missing values or NAs, it'll return missing NA. This says first remove the missing values and then take them. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the now. I'm gonna have two survival curves, one for males at mean age and mean weight loss, one for females at mean age and mean weight loss. What you'll see in the, uh, the tidy table of the survival functions is that there's two columns now, one called estimate.1 and one called estimate.2. This is the survival function for males. This is the survival function for females. You get a standard error for each of them, and what's not displayed is you'll also get a confidence interval for each of these two survival curves, okay? And of course, we can plot them, okay? But again, now we have two curves and we want to be able to plot these two curves. So I put the model object returned by surfit in the plot, and I, again, because there are two curves, I have to ask for confidence intervals and I use colors to differentiate them. But this is predicted survival from a Cox model now, not Kaplan Meier curves, okay? And again, the red curve is the curve for females. Blue is the curve for males. We know that females have a lower hazard overall, so they have better survival. <clears throat> again, though, we can use ggsurf plot here because Sometimes for me, it's a little hard to see what's going on in these plots. It's a little easier to see it in the ggsurf plot. If you do ggsurf plot, it's gonna look very similar to how we did it before, but there's one new wrinkle. You do have to supply that data set again to ggsurf plot. So that plot data set that I used to predict the data and serve fit right here, I have to again specify in ggsurf plot. So just specify the plot of the data again. This time I turn the censoring indicators off because this is predicted survival. So it doesn't make sense to have sensors in there. And then I actually use some options here just to change these levels right here. This is what legend.labs does. It changes this to male and female. Previously, I think it says straight of one, two. But here, this is a nice set of curves. 
where you can more easily tell that they're probably different, right? For the most part, there is not too much overlap between these two curves. So our expectation might be that there is a significant difference between males and females. If we look at our original output for the Cox model, we can see that the p-value for sex is indeed So that's why we have more clearly separated curves um, because it appears that sex may in fact affect survival. Okay, so remember that the hazard ratio was 0.6, meaning that females have 0.6 the hazard of males, which again means that um, females have overall better survival than males because the confidence intervals not overlapping is by design. I'm not sure what you mean by design. Um, it does happen to be like this. It, this is the data. The data, th these are the confidence intervals. And the data tell us that, well, maybe there's a there's not so easy to tell differences between males and females here, but maybe here. Yeah, this is not something I told it to do. It creates 95% confidence intervals based on the data. Um, also in this example, it was intuitive to visualize gender. How does one visualize continuous predictors like age? Okay, so for something like age, what I would do, sorry. Sorry, is in my new data set. Here, I would put different ages here. I could put like age 20, 40, 60, for instance, and then I would get three curves, right? So you would just pick different ages and then look at the curves and again, look for overlap in the confidence intervals, for instance, yeah. So I would just pick select ages, meaningful ages, and then plot several of them and then look at the results. Um, maybe I can actually do that really. Nah, that might take too long, never mind. Okay. Um, All right, so yeah, that's it for plotting predicted survival. Any questions so far about predicted survival, plotting these curves? Remember the curve itself, the shape of this curve is actually determined by non-parametric estimation of the baseline survival. So something like Kaplan-Meier is being used here to estimate this shape, but then the distance between these two shapes, the distance between these two curves is what is being estimated by the, by the Cox model. But the actual shape of the curve is not being estimated by. Okay, so as we discussed before, the Cox model assumes proportional hazards, and we also discussed that it's important for you to um, assess this assumption. The y-axis here again is still the probability of survival. So, for instance, at time 500, for a, a female who is at mean age and mean weight loss, we would say that females at mean age and mean weight loss have, I'm sorry, have about a 0.4 probability of surviving beyond 500 days. However, for males at mean age and mean weight loss, males have like a 0.27 probability of surviving beyond past five. Okay, so this is the probability of surviving beyond this many days. Predicted though, now this is predicted. Okay, so as I was saying, you will need to assess the proportional hazards assumption in order for you to have confidence in the validity of your results. There are lots and lots of methods that have been developed to assess the proportional hazards assumptions. Here I'm going to discuss two methods that were developed by the authors of the survival package because they're the easiest to use with this package and they're good. The first one is a test, and it's a chi-square test based on the Schoenfeld residuals. I do not have time today to go over what the Schoenfeld residuals are. It's kind of a difficult concept to understand. So I'm gonna leave that, but just know that there, it's a kind of residual. So it's some statistic that's calculated after running this Cox model. And um, we can run a chi-square test on these residuals to test for proportional hazards. 
the COTS.ZPH function will perform this test for us. The null hypothesis is that the covariate effect is constant or proportional over time. In other words, the null hypothesis is that this covariate obeys proportional hazards. The alternative is that the, constant change, the covariate effect changes over time, which means that the effect of the covariate is not constant, which means we do not have proportional hazards. Okay, if you run cox.zph, you'll get a test for each covariate individually and a test for all of them together at once, a joint test. So all I do is I put, again, the object created by cox.zph and I'm sorry, the object created by cox.ph. Cox.ph is the cox fitting function. It produced this object, lung.cox. That object I put inside of cox.zph to do the chi-square test of proportional hazards, okay? Here we see the individual tests and the global tests. None of these have uh, really low p-values. The one we might be concerned about is sex, right? It has, it's getting there. Um, okay, so that's the chi-square test. Another tool we can use is to plot um, a curve over these Schoenfeld residuals. So these plots down here are actual, these are plots of the residuals, and then we're gonna plot kind of like a best fitting curve over them. Um, to create this plot, you just put um, the ZPH object, Cox.ZPH object inside a plot. So literally take this whole thing right here and stick it inside a plot, okay? This will produce these uh, plots of the smooth Schoenfeld residuals. So these are all the residuals. And then you do a best fit line or kind of a best fit curve across time. And if, if the hazards are proportional, then this line will be flat. But if this line is not flat, that suggests there's non-proportional hazards. What's interesting is that these plots actually plot the beta value itself, the value of the coefficient itself on the y-axis. So it's basically saying that the coefficient for age is somewhere between like 0.1 and zero, right? So if we look at our results for age, this coefficient, this is the coefficient it's plotting, right? It's at zero. So the, sorry. The y-axis is the estimate of the coefficient itself at this particular time point. Some, these are not, it's not always easy to assess what's going on in these plots. But again, what you're really looking for is a flat line. So I think I have one good one. This one looks nice. This is what we're looking for. We wanna see a flat line across time because you know this is again, the estimate of the coefficient. And if this is not flat, that means that the coefficient is changing over time. And one that really looks like that is this one for sex. Now remember the, the test for sex was you know, approaching 0.05. So this is the one we expect to have a non-flat line. And it does kind of appear to be sloping upwards over time. It looks like there's a strong effect of sex at the beginning of time, but that as time progresses, it, it converges towards zero, right? So at the beginning of time, it's pretty strong effect, but at the end of time, it's uh, close to zero. So you'll see here, it's, a, it's around negative one here and it's around zero here. The actual estimate we get from the Cox model is um, negative 0.5, kind of in between. It's kind of halfway in between those two points. So it's kind of saying, well, it's ne around negative one here, it's around zero here. So I'm gonna say it's around negative 0.5. But it's really not negative 0.5 the whole way, right? It's kind of changing over time. So we should think about addressing that. So both the test and the graph suggest there may be some evidence of violation of proportional hazards by sex. This one for age, it's a little hard to tell. Again, is this enough of uh, a change in the coefficient to care about? You know, you need to look at the scale of changes too. Like it goes from 0.1 to negative 0.1. These aren't huge changes. It's not going from negative one to zero, for instance. 
it's just fluctuating between one and negative, I'm sorry, fluctuating between 0.1 and negative 0.1. And so, yeah, the chi-square test was not significant. Maybe it's okay to ignore this, this graph, okay? But that's how you assess proportional hazard. If this p-value is less than 0.05, that's an indicator. And if this graph is not flat, that's another indicator. So what do you do if you found that one of your variables violate? Well, there are many strategies that have been developed to account for violation of proportional hazards. We're gonna discuss two of them here. The first strategy is to stratify by the non-proportional hazard variable. So for instance, we could stratify our model by sex. I'll talk about that in a moment. Another way to account for it is to actually model the change over time. So we can add an interaction of the violating variable with time to the model to allow that coefficient to change over time, okay? And this can be done within a Cox model. However, you know, if you, especially if you have large data, with large data, you'll be able to detect small changes in the coefficient over time, really small changes, for instance, if you have really large data. In those cases, you know, it's up to you as an expert to determine whether the change in that coefficient is meaningful or not. You know, if the coefficient is two and it becomes 2.01 at the end of time, maybe that's not of a big enough change for you to care about. And if your data are big enough, you might be able to detect a change that small. But if it changes from two to five at the end of time, you probably really do care about that. Okay, so, you know, as with everything else, there's no clear bright lines in statistics where you can say, do this if this, do that if that just doesn't work like that. It's gonna take some you know, subjective judgment in order to assess proportional hazards. But what we can do instead is sensitivity analyses. What we can do is present our models where we try to account for proportional hazards and models where we ignore the violation of proportional hazards, and then we can see if our results really change. So for instance, imagine we're not actually interested in sex that much. We wanna just control for its effects. But what we're really interested in is, is weight loss. We're really interested in the effect of weight loss on survival, but we're really just using sex as a control variable. But since sex may violate proportional hazards, we're worried that it will invalidate our results for weight loss, right? So what we're gonna do is where we have our model results where we ignore proportional hazards. That's the original model, this model right here. So in this model, where we ignore possible violation of proportional hazards by sex, this is the effect of weight loss. And what we wanna do is we wanna run models where we do address the violation of proportional hazards and then see how our inferences regarding weight loss change. Usually what we want is that the inferences don't change, that our model results are robust to whether or not we account for the violation of proportional hazards or not, okay? So again, this is the original model where we assume proportional hazards for sex. Maybe that's not the right assumption. So what we're gonna do now is one models where we account for that violation. And the first approach is to do a stratified model. Stratification is just a general approach to account for the effects of variables. And it can even control for the effects of non-proportional hazards variables. The drawback of this approach is that you will not get a, uh, an effect estimated for this variable. You won't have any sort of coefficient estimated. So if I needed to know the effect of sex, this might not be the best way. But again, if I only am using sex as a control variable, I don't care about its coefficient, this is perfectly fine. So what happens in the stratified Cox model is that the Cox model is actually estimated completely separated uh, in the two stratum. So we basically separate the data by stratum and then estimate the Cox model separately within each stratum. Then, uh, oh, another thing, a very important thing is that the baseline hazard function is allowed to be different across strata. I know this sounds weird since we don't um, actually specify the baseline hazard, but what this really means is that it's allowed to be different 
we're not assuming that it's the same. We're not assuming that it's the same. And by not assuming the baseline hazard is the same across strata, this allows for non-proportional effects of that variable, okay? So stratification is just a very general way to control for the effect of any kind of variable. <clears throat> Instead, you can stratify by that variable and it'll control for any kind of effects that it has, okay? Then once we estimate it separately across strata, then we put all the results together, we average them and we present one set of coefficients, okay? So here I wanna stratify by sex. It's very simple. All you do is uh, put sex within strata inside the parentheses in the model formula. So the only thing I've done is put sex within strata here. That's it. Then what it will do is it will split the data by sex, run the Cox model in each model, not assuming the baseline hazard is the same between those two groups. And then it will average the coefficients together, okay? So these are the average coefficients between the two sexes. And again, we really wanna see if our inferences regarding weight loss have changed. And really they haven't. So weight loss, if anything, has a very, very small effect, tiny. And its p-value is not very significant. Um, the confidence interval, we can't tell if it's above one or below one. Everything is basically the same. Confidence interval has below one and above one. P-value is very close to one. Effects are all tiny. So in this case, it doesn't really matter whether, whether we account for the violation of proportional hazards in, by sex in the model or we don't, at least with regard to our inferences regarding weight loss, okay? So this is one approach. This is the approach where we stratify. Notice that we don't have any sex effect in this model, right? But we do have age and weight loss effects. So for those of you that have a violating variable where that variable is just a control variable, this might be a good strategy for you. Would stratification be more or less the same as random effects introduced in the model? Um, let me think about that. So stratification is you, I mean, yeah, you can, hmm. I still think I, I'll have to review this, but I believe random effects are multiplicative terms on the baseline hazard. So the baseline hazard, I think, is still constrained to have the same shape with random effects, but it's gonna be, you know, kind of higher or lower, overall elevated or overall lower, but overall the same shape. Stratification actually says the shape of the hazard can be completely different between the strata. So I think the answer to your question is no. Yeah. Okay. The second way to account for violation of proportional hazard is to actually model the change in that coefficient over time. Um, this is basically like adding an interaction of time to the model. Okay. Now, for those of you that know about interactions, you might have learned that you can usually add an interaction by just multiplying the two variables together and then adding that product term to the model. You can't do that here. You actually cannot do this in survival data. You can't just multiply the terms together and then add it. It just doesn't work that way. You can only do it if your data are structured in a very special way. And if you wanna do that, see this function called serve split. Uh, in the survival package. Otherwise, don't even bother to try to do this multiplication. Instead, we're gonna, uh, you should, we're gonna recommend that you use this TT function, uh, which stands for time transform. Because if you try to manually create this interaction term yourself by multiplication, you'll probably screw it up. Uh, so just be careful. Instead, use TT. It's very simple. It's gonna look a little weird at first, but it's actually very simple to code. So the, to use this, first in the model formula, you wanna put the variable itself and then the variable inside of TT. So I have sex by itself and sex within TT here. Then I have to define the TT function, okay? 
inside of Cox pH. So it's also inside of Cox pH, I put TT equals and always start it out just like this, like I have it highlighted. Always start out the definition, TT equals function X comma T comma dot, dot, dot. Just copy and paste that every time. After that though, is where you specify how the covariate changes with time. This is very flexible and that it allows the covariate to change with different functions of time. So for instance, if you want to allow the, co the coefficient to just gradually increase or gradually decrease over time, you do X star T. If you want it to change with magnitudes of time, so for instance, every time time doubles, if you use log two, for instance, then you could do X times log T. Or if you think that it just suddenly changes after some threshold of time, like it has one value before time 100 and one value after time 100, you could do something like this, all right? Where it says the coefficient takes on a value depending on whether time is greater than or less than 100, okay? All of these are possible. There is many, you know, you can basically put anything you can think of where you believe how the coefficient changes with time. Okay, for the purposes of this workshop, I'm only going to be using the linear time uh, functional form right here. Okay, because in particular, it matches that picture we saw earlier, right? This picture kind of suggests that the effect of sex is changing linearly over time. It's kind of gradually going towards zero. So we're modeling that with this specification, all of this here. Okay, sex. TT sex, and then the definition of TT right here. That's all you need. Then I run that in Cox. Here's the output. So we have two terms here, one term for sex and one term for TT sex. This sex term, this is the effect of sex at time equals zero. And then this is the change in the sex effect for each additional unit of time because I did it this way. So the interpretation of this TT sex is going to depend on how you coded time here or the time function. All right. So this is a linear effect of, of time on the sex variable. And you can see that these estimates actually match this picture really closely. So again, this is the effect of sex at time equals zero. And it's saying it should be about negative 0.94. Look at the graph. It's right around there, right around negative 0.94 right here. So um, these estimates match this graph pretty closely, all right? And so this is a test of whether that coefficient seems to be changing linearly with time. And again, it's kind of borderline. It's not clear. <clears throat> and this kind of, this actually coincides with the p-value from um, Cox's EPH too, right? One. So some people actually skip the Cox.ZPH test and go directly here. And this, this test right here is sometimes used as a test of proportional hazards as well. So not only is it a test of proportional hazards, it's also the fix for it if you happen to detect it, right? But overall here, sex may or may not be violating proportional hazards. Again, though, what we're really interested in is whether the effect of weight loss changes when we do these different models. And in all cases, the effect of weight loss still seems to still be more or less the same, very small, can't tell the direction. Okay. Any questions about this, about how we assessed the proportional hazards assumption? Yeah. They ask about the interaction term. Yeah. Interaction, interaction term, I explained, is just another variable like other variable, if you have time varying covariate yes. with one of those variable, then you have to adjust for interaction as well. Yes. Um, so yeah, interaction terms in general are just product terms and interactions allow the effect of one variable to depend on the other variable. So a lot of times this is known as moderation or effect modification. So, so for instance, if we have treatment and gender and we interact them, we're saying that we're allowing the effect of treatment to depend on gender. Here, we're interacting sex with time, 
So here we're saying we're allowing the effect of sex to change with time. The problem here is that you can't form this interaction simply by multiplying sex with your time variable. That will absolutely be wrong unless you have your data structured in a very special way like this. If you want to have interaction of treatment with sex instead, I'm sorry, here, sorry, age and sex. Here we have age and sex. I could, I could, I could just simply use those, uh, the product of those two terms and enter it, that is another variable. It's specifically, you cannot interact it with time just by multiplying it. So yeah, any other two covariates you can interact just by multiplying them together, okay? Okay, the final topic I wanna to discuss today is time varying covariates. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end of time. So we're, we're getting pretty close to the, the final slides too. So let me just finish this because I know some of you will have questions about this. One of the great attractive uh, features of the Cox model is that it quite easily accommodates time very covariance. Um, but you have to structure your data in a special format to use it. Each subject is gonna have multiple rows of data and you're gonna need uh, two time variables for this stop start stop format. One time variable should mark the beginning of an interval and the other time variable should mark the end of an interval. The status variable records the event status at the end of each interval, okay? So if you have single event data like death, the only time this event can be a one or it should be recording an event is at the last interval, right? Every interval before that should not have the event occur. Otherwise, that subject has to leave. You know, subjects leave once they experience the event. So generally, for multiple rows, if it's a single event data, the event will only be in the last row, if at all. Um, if there are no time gaps, the start time of an interval would be the stop time of the previous interval. So use the same number as the start of the next interval as the stop of the previous interval, all right? Those should be the same number. And when the covariate changes value, you want the time when it changes to be the beginning of a new interval, okay? So this subject four right here is the one that has a time varying covariate, right? He has two rows of data. And we can see from time zero to time 35, he had not had his transplant yet. I'm, I'm pretending he, I'm saying he, I don't know. He had not had his transplant yet and he had not experienced the event. He experienced the transplant at time 35, at month 35, and experienced the event at month 38. So the beginning of the interval is marked when exactly the transplant occurred. And then the end of the interval here actually marks when the event occurred. It does not necessarily, you know, this is not necessarily a one, but yes, this means that from zero to 35, no transplant, 35 to 38, there is a transplant. And at 38, the event occurs, okay? So the main point with time variant covariates is that you have to have your data structured like this. Every time a covariate changes value, You'll need a new row marking exactly the time period when that value is valid, okay? Anytime, if it changes again, you'll need to have another new row. And if you have multiple, this can be very complicated if you have multiple time variant covariates, because anytime any one of them changes, you'll need a new row for, and you'll need a new time interval, okay? So the main, uh, challenge with time variant covariates is just getting the data set up correctly, all right? But once you have it in this format, um, again, then you can just run it as is. So you're gonna specify a different serve specification. You'll use the beginning time variable as time, and then the end time variable as time two. And then event again records whether the event occurred at the end of the time interval or not, okay? And so <clears throat> this is now serve, start, stop, event. And then I can put my list of predictors on the right side. <clears throat> and then everything else is basically the same as before. I'm gonna get my, my estimates, my hazard ratios, 
and I can follow all the same procedures I did before. I can do proportional hazards assumptions, I can test for the proportional hazards, and I can do survival curves too. Okay, so plotting time variant covariates is actually quite simple with Cox models. It's really just getting your data set up correctly. All right. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we're not really going to have time to run through the exercise today. Um, we're running out of time today, and I want to get you out of time, uh, out of here on time. So I'm going to skip the exercise. If you want to stay behind and do this with me, I'm happy to do it. If you want to try it yourself and you have questions about it, please feel free to ask. Um, the solutions are at the bottom of your code file. Um, so if you, do I have this code file? Yeah, the solutions are basically right down here if you want to look at them. Okay. So some things I didn't talk about today are some additional flexibility of the COX-PH function. If you need to do recurrent events modeling, you can do it in COX-PH. If, if you need to do competing risk modeling, you can also do it in COX-PH. Look into the vignette called survival for instructions or guidance on how to do these things. Some of you have asked about random effects. Um, some of you already know about random effects models in COX. I'm um, sorry, in survival, random effects are often called frailty terms. Basically, you know, some subjects may be, may be more prone to failure, and we will call them more frail, in other words. So you can add one frailty random effect to a Cox pH model through this frailty um, function. But if you want to, in general, do mixed effects Cox modeling, um, they recommend that you use the Cox ME package. So I mentioned that down here, which has more flexibility for frailty random effects. It is also written by Terry Turneau, who wrote the survival package. So it'll have very similar syntax, probably be able to use a lot of the same functions. So if you're going to do a lot of random effects modeling, look into Cox ME. Uh, there's also robust and cluster robust variance estimation. Uh, look at the robust and cluster options in Cox PH. And then finally, if you have weights, you can also add those to the model. Um, and they might be treated as frequency weights or as sampling weights. Look into the weights argument in the Cox PH help file. If you need to do parametric regression, there is an additional function in the survival package called ServReg. All right. Remember that Cox PH is semi parametric, ServReg is the parametric uh, survival. Okay, We're, we did not talk about any of those models today, so uh, I can't really speak more about them. Finally, for references, um, the survival package has some of the best vignettes of any R package out there. I'm really not kidding. So for instance, the vignette for survival itself, you just put in vignette, survival, then it will open up this PDF. You can see that it's written by Terry Turneau himself, the author of the package and an expert in the field. And it's a really nicely written tutorial on how to use the package. So this is one of the main references for anybody using survival, but actually survival has quite a few vignettes. Um, so you can look, use any of these vignettes for more details about specific survival analyses. The one I use quite often also is time depth which is uh, when you need to model time varying covariates or time varying coefficients, okay? Um, mentioned those two. And then these are the books um, that I use as references for this uh, workshop today, uh, the two by Gramps and Turneau, and also this. For those of you that are a little less comfortable with math, um, this is a, more applied book, I would say. Uh, the Turneau and Gramps book is a little more math intensive. Not that, not that difficult, but definitely more intensive than this one. This is definitely more applied. So if you like a more applied text, um, I would look into this one. Okay, and I think that is going to be the end of this workshop. Uh, let me say thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing.